Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, this week we're not meeting at Castle School because there wasn't another event happening there this morning. Um, if you did turn up and you're watching this video afterwards, I really do apologise. Um, it was likely to be Nick Webb's fault, so we will have a word with him later. Um, but I've been asked to share God's word with you this morning um, directly into your homes. So this morning I wanted to look at Joshua chapter 6 and hopefully examine how it can help us to persevere in our Christian faith journey. Um, a good place to start would be to pray, so why don't we do that now? So Father God, I just ask uh, this morning that you would be on my mouth and actually you would be in that gap between where the words leave my mouth and they reach people's ears and you would filter out anything that you do not want to go to people, what people don't need to hear, and actually you would add whatever you want to add to what I'm saying this morning. Amen. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, why don't you open it, switch it on, or pause this video for a second and go and grab it, or if you'd like, I'll just pause myself for a second. There we go. Hopefully that was enough time. And then if you can turn with me to Joshua chapter 5, and we're going to be reading from verses 13 to chapter 6 and verse 21. So now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets on ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance, march around the city with an armed guard, going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, and then shout. So he had the Ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord, while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout! Shout for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house 
shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a Bible story that I've heard a number of times in many different ways over the years. Um, some of them through Sunday school, at other times maybe a VeggieTales video or done as a sketch during a church service. Um, and even apparently during the 90s it was released as a Nintendo video game. However, it's a passage that over the last couple of years I've been mulling it over and, and through it God has been speaking to me about perseverance and the need for it in the church today. And what I find interesting in this passage is that God speaks to Joshua and instructs him to walk around the walls of Jericho once a day for six days, then seven times on the seventh day, and then for the priest to blow a loud note in the army to give a shout, at which point the walls will collapse. However, Joshua, the Bible says, just instructs the priest to walk around the city with the ark and for the army to go before and behind them. And it's probably likely that Joshua did share the whole plan, but the Bible doesn't tell us that. It just says that they got up the next day and they walked around the walls again. And what I find incredible is that actually they got through all seven days, doing exactly as God had instructed them. And especially as it's likely that there would have been no sign that anything was changing each day until the walls finally came down. As I've thought about this passage, and I've often wondered what it would be like if God called us as a church to do the same today. Would we make it to day seven, or even all the way around Jericho on day one, or would we even make it to day one? And I'm going to be a bit naughty, but I've, as I said, I've wondered what it would look like if the passage were written today, and whether it would be something like this. So Joshua got up and he instructed the priests and army to walk around the walls of Jericho, instructing the army not to make a sound. And then on day two, the priests and the army started walking around the walls and someone asked if Joshua had really heard from God about it because no cracks seem to be appearing yet and nothing seems to be happening. On day four, only half the priests and the army were continuing to walk. And a comment was made that if you always do what you've always done, then you're always going to get what you've always got. And so far, nothing has happened. So should we be doing something maybe different tomorrow? On day five, only a quarter of the number turned out. And someone reminded Joshua of Einstein's comment about um, the definition of insanity being doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And by day six, less than 10% were out walking around the walls. And many of them had decided that maybe they needed to carry rocks and throw them against the walls because God clearly needed help as nothing was changing. On day seven, Joshua went to walk around the walls seven times but gave up by the third time, completely discouraged as everyone else had given up and stayed in the camp. Now, I know that's probably been quite harsh for us, but my question and challenge for all of us and myself included is, at what point do we normally check out? When do we stop turning up and when does our perseverance run out? On what day would we have stopped walking or would we have even started? And if my attempts at regular exercise regimes and my Bible in a year or anything to go by, I would likely struggle to get to day three, probably. 
In Psalm 25, verse 1, the psalmist writes, In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. The Israelites going around these walls had to trust God each day, no matter what, despite how ludicrous it seemed what they were doing. But that's what God called the Israelites to do. And they did it because they lived in the expectation that God would come through because he had before. And all they had to do was to be faithful and persevere and trust him. And my question is, what is God calling us to do? And what are we needing to just trust him and persevere and keep going no matter how ludicrous it may seem? And if we go back 40 years before the Israelites had even arrived at Jericho, we see a different story. In the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14, we see a search party was sent into the promised land to find out what it was like. And the people that had gone out, the spies, they came back and they said, this land is great. It's just as God has promised, flowing with milk and honey. That even brought back some fruit to show how great it was. It was that good. But no matter how good it was, there was a majority in that number that said, Do you know what? It's great, but the people are huge and we will surely not defeat them. They spread rumours around the Israelites, even lying about the land they had just seen, forgetting about God who had taken them out of slavery. And how often... Does God call us to do things and we look at it and go, yes, that would be amazing, that would be great, but there's surely no way we can do that. And we don't even get to day one. And so God led them back into the wilderness. God's promise to Israel hadn't changed. They were still his people. He was still going to be their God And the Israelites would still enter the promised land and arrive at Jericho, but not yet. They were clearly not ready to trust God. And how often has God shown us the promised land and we've not been ready to trust him? So he said, my promise doesn't change. I will stay faithful to you. But now isn't the right time. Clearly, it needs to be the next generation. And for the Israelites, it took them 40 years of wandering around the desert for them to fully trust God. And for those that didn't trust God to die off, in a sense, for the dead wood in that nation to be removed. You know, on Wednesday, I was at a Bible study group and we were looking at the story of Abraham and Isaac. And when God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on the altar... But then God told him to stop before he'd even done it. And and we talked about how God was revealing something about himself through that, which I don't have time to preach on today or to kind of go into. But if you want to find out what that was that God was revealing, I think I preached on it a couple of years ago. It's on the church website under kind of the Stories of Salvation series. Go and have a look. It's kind of incredible what God's doing when we understand the context of everything that was happening there. But however, when we were discussing this passage on Wednesday, one of the things that was said was that we couldn't understand why God had to do it that way. And and we were kind of saying that if it had been us, surely we would have done it another way. Surely we wouldn't have put Abraham through the anguish of having to kind of actually put his son on the wood ready to be sacrificed. And to be honest, in all likelihood, if I was facing the walls of Jericho today, I'm not sure walking around them would be my first choice. But the truth is that God knew best and he still knows best today. As Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So many of you will know that I'm currently studying um, a degree in theology and if it's okay I'd like to just share a bit of kind of first year theology study with you. Um, If nothing else you can use it to impress your friends maybe over a coffee or bring it up at the next small group meeting. 
Um, but it's believed that the books of Joshua through to Kings 2 uh, were part of a single, single literary work that was edited together from pre-existing texts or traditions within the Israelite nation. And these books collectively have come to be known as the Deuteronomistic History Books. I'll say that again, Deuteronomistic History Books. And it's believed that they follow a theological principle based on the book of Deuteronomy. And that is that if Israel still is faithful to God and follows his commands, he will be faithful to them. Now, there are different questions over whether these texts were edited initially and then um, added to and adjusted afterwards. And we don't need to worry about that today. But I think the theological principle at the core of these books is really significant for us and individuals and collectively as a church today. And it leads me to ask myself and all of us, what is God calling us collectively and individually to be faithful in today? What is he asking us to persevere in? And where are we being called to go again to? Where do we need to press on? For some, we just need to keep praying, even after what may be decades with no breakthrough, no change, nothing seems to be happening. God is just saying, keep going, keep walking. For others, maybe we just need to keep turning up to that job, turning up to that club, that group, whatever it is that we're in. And it might be that you're questioning why you're there and it might feel like you're not doing anything significant. And let me be honest. It doesn't feel like walking around walls is that significant, but God knows what's going on and God works through everything. And right now he's just saying, keep going, keep walking. Things are going to happen. Things are going to change. And over the last seven years of managing our church's cap debt centre in Taunton, there have been many times where I've just wanted to stop walking, stop turning up. When we've had a succession of clients who, when we go to see them, they're not there and you go, really, come on, <laughs> Lord. When you've kind of spent the morning praying for them and you're like, why are they not there? Or when we ask at the end of a visit if we can pray for them and we have times where we just get a polite, actually, no, it's okay. And after a few times in a row of that happening, you start to say, well, is there any point in actually asking anymore? Do we just stop asking prayer because they're going to say no anyway? Or we stop sharing the gospel because we believe that nobody wants to hear it. And to be honest, all the devil wants us to do is to just stop walking, just stop pressing, just stop asking those questions. And to be honest, we start to forget that Joshua and the Israelites weren't actually called to break down the walls of Jericho. That was God's job. Joshua and the Israelites' job was just to walk around the walls. And they were just called to face, faithfully persevere and carry on with it. And likewise, God is not asking us to break down the walls of people's hearts He's just asking us to turn up, do what we've been asked to do, do what he's called us to do and persevere. And, you know, Paul in Romans chapter five, he talks about how perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And for the Israelites to take the land that God was giving them, they would need a lot of perseverance. Walking around the walls of Jericho was the easy part. And we need the same perseverance today. Because when we persevere, we will see God break through again and again. And a good example of this perseverance can be seen in the story of capping Christians against poverty. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference celebrating Cap's 25th birthday. And at the conference, they were sharing the story of the charity from day one how John and Lizzie Kirkby started the charity just with a £10 donation and nothing else. And they were saying that actually for the first 13 years of the charity running, 
No one was paid on time. Each month, they would send out an email asking members of staff to share what money they needed to cover their bills and expenses and ask them just to give them that information and they would cover their bills and their expenses but the likelihood is they couldn't pay them any more right now. And there were months when some members of staff would actually give up their salary for that month so that others could be paid. But during this time they still felt that God was calling them to grow the charity and although not knowing how they would pay them, they were still taking on more staff where they needed them. And in faith, they were believing that God would cover the bills eventually. And actually they came up against a lot of criticism and opposition because of that, mainly from Christians, but they just felt that this was what God was calling them to and he was constantly asking them to press on and keep going. And after 13 years, they suddenly saw breakthrough and God came through for them. And since then, they have always had enough money to pay all members of staff on time and in full. And actually, John Kirkby, the founder, would say that there were times when they, he just wanted to give up. But every time I see him, he always speaks and he always reminds us that when God calls you to something, keep going and he will break through. And actually, John would say that the stuff that they learned as a charity back then in those early days have allowed them to go on much, much further and progress further and do more than they probably would have ever have done if everyone had been paid early or everyone had been paid on time every month in full from day one. He said they would never have had the faith to go on and do what they currently do. And from that kind of seed, from that just carrying on walking, no matter what was happening, actually thousands and thousands of lives have been changed through that organisation. And so normally at this point in time, if we were meeting together, uh, we would go into a time of ministry and we would be kind of getting into groups and praying for one another. And I'm aware that some people are meeting together in groups today. Um, so now would be a good time to just get together in twos and threes and minister to one another. Um, now, unfortunately, I don't have a band with me to ask to pray, but or to ask to play, sorry. But if you want to put on a worship CD at home, that's fine, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, but I believe that probably people are falling into three categories today. And there's those that have been faithful to God and you're still persevering despite not seeing any breakthrough. Maybe they were things that God called you to years ago and you're still waiting and nothing seems to be happening. I just want to pray that God would continue to strengthen you and encourage you to just keep going, keep pressing on and he would strengthen you in that. And then there's those that just it feels like you can't take another step. You've been walking around, it feels like a hundred times and still nothing's changed. And maybe even it feels like things have got worse. Whether it's praying for your family, friends, neighbours or work colleagues to come to Jesus or breakthroughs in other areas. And you're still walking, but you're just doing it out of habit than anything else. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill you afresh and renew your strength and your hope and would build up your expectation of God again. And then maybe there's those that have just stopped walking and you stopped years ago. Nothing changed so you thought, what's the point? And I believe that God is calling you to start walking again. He's saying, I'm not worried whether you stopped. I just want you to start. He says, will you press on? Will you persevere? Will you go again with me? So shall we pray? Lord, I ask that you would just reveal to each and every one of us where we are. Holy Spirit, would you come and move now? And would you just touch everyone's heart? 
would you encourage us collectively as a body, as Taunton Vineyard Church, to be pressing on forward? Would we not be like the spies that came back and although we saw how great things would be, we were worried by what we would be coming up against? Lord, would you go before us and would you light our path as you lit the Israelites' path? And will you fill us with trust in you?